Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, in what is probably one of my favorite episodes ever, we welcome to the show Elizabeth Crone. Elizabeth, along with Dr. Jeff Kripal, is the author of Changed in a Flash, which is the story of her being struck by lightning dying, and returning from the afterlife very much changed. Uh, It's a truly fascinating discussion. Enjoy. Elizabeth, welcome aboard. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be a fascinating chat. But so what usually happens for first-time guests, Elizabeth, is that they have I have a traditional first question, which is, were you a weird kid? But, like in your case, your whole story is almost like, as a matter of fact, my story is is almost the opposite. But, uh, Elizabeth, were you a weird kid? <laughs> I was such a weird kid. <laughs> I was a very weird kid. But not in the way that you mean the question, I don't think. Um, no, in the sense of, did I have any type of... Um, extrasensory perceptions or premonitions or anything like that. No, I was dull, boring, and normal. But weird I like you, I was weird. But weird like you, I don't know, collected strange books or um, <laughs> just like you were an odd child rather than a weird kid. Is that what you mean? No. Yeah, I guess so. I, I, oh boy. Um, well, I guess anyone that reads my book will find this out, but from from the time that I was six years old until I was twelve, I was um I was sexually molested. And that made me feel like I was different <laughs> or weird. And um so I guess in that sense I was because I was different. Um most kids don't have that happening to them. Um but anyone looking at me from the outside would have thought I was perfectly normal. Yeah, gotcha. And yeah, you do mention that in the book because it, um, as far as you can tell, mm-hmm. it, in that weird way, obviously it's awful that it happened, but there is something about that um, mm-hmm. traumatic experience you went through that um, relates to the the topic of what we're here to discuss, which is you visiting the afterlife. Absolutely. And in fact, if if it did not relate to that, there's no way I would have uh, put that in the book or discussed it with, with anyone, because it's not a very pleasant topic. Um, but it, it totally um, does relate to what happened to me. Uh, I don't know if it's the fact that it was, uh, quote unquote, trauma, or uh, exactly what it was, but when this was happening to me as a child, I would dissociate, I guess. I would, um, as this was happening, I would leave my body and go elsewhere because I couldn't just lie there and take the pain, so I left. And so, therefore, when I was struck by lightning um, years later, uh, that was my first thought was, I, hey, I know how to do this. I can leave. I don't have to stay here and take this pain. I can get out of here. And th- actually, the most important thing was I knew how to come back. Yeah, that was what's fascinating in the book because, mm-hmm. yeah, the, uh, and I'm sure you've had this conversation with Dr. Kripal, but there are, there's a lot of very interesting research on the relationship between a trauma incident and and sort of psi or paranormal capacities afterwards. And and that's not just right. modern people. That's if you look at the story of, say, saints and, and, and so on, mm-hmm. you, you see that motif um, fairly commonly. Correct. But by the same token, 
there is also this very Terence McKenna idea that one of the, the purposes of life is to almost like prepare yourself for dying so that the act of death doesn't come as a shock. And it's the coming and going. It's the coming back mm -hmm. that's sort of almost like very ancient Egyptian, really. But it, it's, it is a fascinating... <laughs> Uh, it, it's a fascinating insight into um, some two things that, you know, uh, right. that happened and, in your and life. Hey, I, I got to say, Gordon, it's a heck of a place to start an interview, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Open <laughs> open with a bang, why not? Like, there like you an go. actual lightning strike? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, um, we should actually, let's, let's do that then. I mean, we've, we've landed on it. Like, tell us about the, that. that um, that evening, the, the actual, the lightning okay. strike evening. Okay. So I was actually taking my two young children. I had two little boys at the time. Um, and now they're grown men and I have a third child. But at the time I had two young boys who were two years old and four years old. And I was taking them to our synagogue um, for the first anniversary of the death of my grandfather, because in Judaism, um, the the deceased are remembered every year, and they read their names during a service. So we were going for that purpose, and we were running late, actually, because I insisted that we take a picture of ourselves, and I had to set up the camera, and it was my own fault that we were running late. But we were running late, and my husband was out of town on business, so it was just me and my two boys, and we pulled into the parking lot, and it had been a gorgeous day. I mean, it had just been beautiful, and as soon as we turned into the parking lot of the synagogue, <laughs> the skies just opened up, and rain was coming down in sheets, and you know, there was booming thunder and, and lightning. It, it was just a hellacious storm that came out of nowhere. And I parked the car, but I didn't want to sit in the car with the boys because I was afraid we would miss the reading of my grandfather's name, which was the whole purpose in our being there to begin with. So I told my four-year-old I was going to uh, let him run to the building, and there was an awning over the door, and I told him that once he got to the building to stand there and wait for me and his younger brother. And I watched him, and he ran to the building, and it was just fine, and he stood there under the cover waiting for us. And I got my two-year-old, and um, I opened the car door, and I was... I decided I needed to let him walk instead of having me carry him because I was trying to control the umbrella with one hand and, you know, juggling that and my handbag and everything else I had, it, it, it was going to be too much to try to, to carry the two-year-old. So I've set him down and I took his hand in, in my right hand and I had the umbrella in my left hand. And we set off across the parking lot. And a few steps into it, suddenly it felt like the the air, like the temperature dropped um, maybe 20 degrees just instantly. It, there was like a, a cool spot, I guess. And at that moment, I looked at my hand that was holding the umbrella and I thought, this is really stupid. I should not be holding an umbrella in a lightning storm. And and furthermore, I looked and, and I said, and look at that. My wedding ring is touching the metal shaft of the umbrella. And before I could let go, I told myself, let go, just let go of the umbrella. And before I could do it, the lightning struck the umbrella, the tip of the umbrella. And it came through the shaft of the umbrella and through my ring and through me and out through my feet. And uh, my, my two-year-old started screaming um, and had his hands plastered to the sides of his head. And later I found out it's because his eardrums had burst and he was in a lot of pain. 
Um, I, I had no idea that lightning was so loud, but uh, it is. It's literally ear-splitting loud. Uh, burst my eardrums also, although I didn't feel it. Um, and my four-year-old saw what happened, and he started running back over to us. Meanwhile, I thought I was fine. And my four-year-old took my two-year-old and started pulling him toward the building. And I thought I was following them into the building. And we got into the lobby. And I thought, wait a minute, where's my umbrella? Because it had been a new umbrella and I knew I had had it. And I turned around and looked out the, the window in the door. And sure enough, there was my umbrella lying in the parking lot, except it wasn't really an umbrella anymore. It was kind of a, a a smoking umbrella skeleton, kind of. And my gaze shifted to the right, and about 20 feet from the umbrella, I saw just this heap on the pavement, and I realized it was me, that I was lying out there on the pavement. And it was extremely disorienting, because how could I be standing inside the building with my my children, yet I'm lying out there in the rain? And I saw that my shoes were gone and the soles of my feet were very burned. And I I actually was very upset about that because the shoes, it was the first time I had worn them. They were brand new. And uh, I had spent quite a bit of money on these shoes. And so I looked down at my feet there in the lobby where I thought I was. And I saw that my shoes were just fine. They were on my feet. Everything was fine. Except my feet weren't touching the ground. I was hovering above the ground by a few inches. And I was really, really confused and disoriented. And meanwhile, someone had um, gone into the back of the synagogue or the sanctuary where the service was already going on and said that we needed a doctor. And <laughs> this synagogue is enormous. It's a very large um, congregation that's situated about two blocks from the, a major Texas medical center. And so about 40 doctors yeah, got up. And, you tell that in the book. It's a cute story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, that's, that's a fact though. Yeah. And they came toward the back. And um, meanwhile, while that was happening, I thought, you know, I knew that my children were going to be okay. I knew that my entire family was there for the reading of my grandfather's name. Um, and I knew that there were a lot of people there that knew who my boys were and, and they were fine. So I thought, well, I'm going to go back out there and, and try and figure this out. So I went back out to where my body was on the ground and I was looking at it from above. And I just, I was willing myself to get up. I, I just couldn't understand why I wasn't getting up. And then suddenly I realized, wait a minute, I'm not getting up because I'm dead. I'm dead. And as soon as I realized that, I felt almost free to explore this other realm where I was, or this other, I, I, I knew I was dead, but why was I still conscious kind of thing? And I, um, also, it would help to understand how uh, skeptical I had always been about this type of thing. I mean, for something like this to happen to me is is really kind of comical because I never would have believed a story like this. Never, ever. I I, I wouldn't have made fun of someone to their face. But privately, I would have thought, well, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> you know, I that that couldn't have happened. Yet here I was, and it was happening. And a, a, a light appeared to my right and 
up above me. And it, I knew that this light, it was kind of moving a little bit, and it wanted me to follow it. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll see what this is. And I followed this, this light, and it led me to the garden, a garden. Except it's not like any garden that would be here on Earth. Um, I I happen to love gardens, and I've been to a lot of them, and this was nothing like anything I've seen here. Um, I I was met when I got to the garden by um, a voice. And the voice was that of my grandfather, who had died a year earlier. And he had a very distinctive voice with a a heavy French accent. He was French. And uh, I knew who who it was. And um, later in the story, though, I I come to realize it's not actually my grandfather, but I, I think it was his voice just to put me at ease and to keep me from being frightened. Um, a- anyway, he, he told me to sit. There was a bench. There was a garden bench, very elaborate, gorgeous garden bench. And I sat, and he sat with me. And I don't think there's anything anyone could say that would convince me that I was not there for two weeks because mm-hmm. I was there for two weeks. The The funny thing is, it, it was like an instantaneous download of information that I received. It, it's not like I learned that time is not linear. It was just that I instantly understood. I, it's like something I knew all along. Do you understand what I'm saying? I yes. I don't really know how to describe it. This is the, the there's a sort of uh, an understanding of the layer cake nature of the universe as you kind of talk about in the book. Exactly, exactly. And the the most overwhelming thing I felt in the garden and I say this and it sounds so trite, but it wasn't was this unconditional love that was so overpowering and so unlike any love here on earth or in this dimension. Um, You know, I have children and that's a pretty unconditional loving relationship. Like there is nothing they can do to make me not love them. That's unconditional. However, this was completely different. Um, This was more intense. Um, deeper, uh, I, you know, I struggle to find the words to describe that feeling, to describe the beauty of this place, um, and I don't know if it's because the words don't exist uh, here, or I'm just not smart enough or educated enough to know what those words are. Uh, but when I use the word beautiful or stunning or it it doesn't even touch the beauty of this place and um somehow i well somehow it was in that instantaneous download i understood that i was um in heaven and I did see other people there in the distance. No one approached me, but I saw other people. And I understood that they were also in heaven, but that they were not seeing what I was seeing. Like, heaven was tailored to to each individual person. And it was whatever is going to put you personally at ease and and make you happy is, is what you see. And for me, that was a garden. And that was just something that I I understood while I was there. It's the most, you know, amazing, amazing stuff. And 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 it's 
uh, how to describe this? The layer cake thing, I kind of get. We, we're very interested in in time and cycles and so on with our premium mm-hmm. members, and and there's a sort of there's a Vedic notion that um, uh, a day on Earth is a month in sort of the land of the dead, but a month hmm. on Earth is a day in the land of the gods. So it's this sort of idea that time does ab- actually move differently. Um, and it's, oh, it's, it it's a way of expressing that, that you, when you say you were in the garden for two weeks, I'm 100% with you. Like, that's where I was. And then, Thank you. And then yes. it's like, <laughs> and, but then obviously, I mean, we might want to return to, to Earth and, and, uh, in a minute, but... Um, mm-hmm. Yes, you were there for two weeks, but on Earth, mm-hmm. um, obviously, people from the synagogue came out and, uh, right. and, and, and uh, t- you know. Uh, so, uh, yes, it was probably, here, it was probably two minutes but, oh, yes. that I was gone. Yeah. But, but there, you, there's no possible way I could have been given the amount of information that I was given in two minutes. So I, I I have a really difficult time understanding the the physics of, of the nonlinear nature of time here. But while I was there, I I just understood it. It it was it's so much more difficult for me now to describe it than it was to actually experience it. To, you're back inside the the, the human linear experience mm-hmm. of it, but it's it's mm-hmm. almost like I, I'll we'll turn this into a question because it's almost like it's one of the key um, lessons is the wrong word um, the key meanings or implications of the entire event because as you were telling us and taking us through the story of like I was late because it was my fault and if I hadn't been doing that and if I hadn't been doing that mm-hmm. and each time it's like one of these things but but more than that uh, that. That story goes back to the beginning of the universe, because if your grandfather hadn't passed on the day he did, you wouldn't have mm-hmm. been in the synagogue the day you exactly. were there. So it's not even right. just it's not even just the whole oh wacky coincidence of me being late. It was mm-hmm. that you were in the right moment of space time because of everything else that has happened or will happen right. in the universe. It's crazy. Correct. It's amazing. Right. Correct. Have have did you happen to read the chapter toward the end of the book? Uh, called Postscript. Yeah, sure. Uh, it, okay, well, it, it's about a, a dream I had about Jeff Kripal and I were were standing and talking to someone. And uh, anyway, I that's exactly what that chapter is about. And basically, it it goes back to uh, perhaps. Um, this was supposed to happen, and it and it went back to before Jeff and I even knew each other. We were working toward that moment. You know, it was a predestined, pre-planned um, moment in time when that lightning struck me. Yeah, and which I think is kind of what you're saying. Oh, it is, and and, and it's and it's difficult to say because predestined isn't the right word if everything's happening at right. once, right? Sure, like it, that's exactly right. Yeah, yes. because we feel it here yeah. on Earth as oh, it is mm-hmm. predestined or God ordained it. I mean, it did happen on holy ground as well. Let's throw that in. Um, mm-hmm. But it's predestined isn't the right word if everything's happening at once. You're right. You're right. But you know, the only way I can understand it is to think about it in linear terms. Mm. I I will be the first to tell you the past, the present, the future are all right now. I I get that. I understand that. But I can't talk about it or describe it unless it's in linear terms. Yeah. I don't know how else to do it. Well, this is, but again, it's because we're here. There are one of these other Vedic concepts, just going back to time moving differently in the land of the dead and, and the gods and so on, is that 25% of the universe, so if the universe is God, is one thing, is mm-hmm. is is manifest in space-time, and the other 75% is is untouched and in an eternal and unmoving state. But we're in that 25, which includes mm-hmm. space and time, and it is experienced differently in, in, in dreams and awake. But it's a model of going like, it's all the one thing, but the 25% kind of like profusion that we exist in 
it's, it kind of smears itself in a linear fashion. And that was their, or that is their under- way of modeling that. And it, I just think we have to go with it. I think we have to use linear terms while we're here. <laughs> right, right. I agree. I, I, I just am not uh, schooled enough to, to understand how to not use linear terms. Yeah, of course. Well, I don't think anyone is. Um, I, I don't think, yeah, I think we just well, have to stumble around. Yeah, and do our best. You're yeah, right. Yeah. You're right. Um, I do think that that Jeff Kripal comes the closest oh, to look, anyone I've ever met. Uh, Dr. Jeff, <laughs> uh, huge fan. Lo- yes. yes his, 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 I've read all his books. He comes on the show regularly. Um, he's a huge inspiration and really wise and insightful about this stuff. Um, it does feel right. ordained to me, or however we're going to use that term, that you guys uh-huh. hooked up. And as he mentions in the intro, like the incident happened to you like essentially around the corner from his office. So it's like, exactly. He knows that that's somehow a part of it. And and that's all we can do is we just need to honestly say mm-hmm. like, I don't know how this works, but there is something about the, these overlaps of, mm-hmm. of people and places that is embedded and significant in this event. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we just have to accept it and, yeah. and go with it. Uh, but you're right. Yes. Well, let's um, let's let's get back to the car park, and after your two weeks in a garden, um, let, let's okay. pick the story up. All right. So when I, I, it took me about three months to to heal from the the burns. But so to interrupt and- Elizabeth because this I love this part of the story because you went home. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. and one of the doctors who was actually in the synagogue <laughs> yes. was <just> like, <laughs> yes. tell that bit. he was okay. So. Uh, when when all of these doctors came came running out to to help me, it turns out that one of them um, is a specialist in electrocution and lightning strike victims, basically. And had they taken me to the hospital immediately, that's who they would have called. Yet there he was, right there. So. Um, he he is the doctor that treated me um and he he explained to me what had happened i i was having a very difficult time at first keeping my eyes open i i was i i don't know if i was tired or or just i just could not keep my eyes open um and my left arm and hand were paralyzed i couldn't move them and he told me what that was called and and that it would last for about uh several hours and it did after about 6 hours i was able to move my hand again and he told me basically um you just need to be treated for the burns and that's what happened i was treated for the burns and during the time i i had to spend about 3 months basically lying in bed because it was the bottom of my feet that were so badly burned and so walking was next to impossible it was very painful so i spent a lot of time in bed and i started realizing um during that time that i would have these dreams or actually nightmares about things and then whatever it was would show up on the news the next day. Like I was, I would have a nightmare about, say, an earthquake. And then the next day, that earthquake would happen exactly as I had dreamt it the night before. And I didn't know what to do with this. And I didn't know why it was happening. And I really didn't like it. Um, was that, so I, this was, because uh, mm-hmm. again, you uh, weren't interested in all this sort of stuff before the incident no. and you hadn't had precognitive dreams before. Um, no. And, and what I, what I'm fascinated by is, did you, you, so you had this, all this time off your feet to, uh, I want to say mm-hmm. process, but we're sort of still processing it, right? All this time off your feet to think about, well, I was... I was somewhere else for two weeks, but it was only a couple of minutes. Did you had you made the decision to start talking about it then, or did you have that to process? And then all of a sudden, oh, it turns out I have precognitive dreams now as well. I wonder if I tell people <laughs> about that. I made a very conscious decision not to talk about it. 
because I thought I was crazy. I thought there's something wrong with me and I better not say anything because then people will know there's something wrong with me. I was afraid that my children would be ostracized or labeled as the children of the crazy mother. Uh, So I pretty much kept it all to myself. Uh, The only people that I talked to about any of it were my husband and my mother. And my husband was, he he was exactly the same way I had been. He, He didn't believe it. He thought that Anytime I had a dream and then something happened, that it was a coincidence. Um, he, he just couldn't accept what was happening to me. And I couldn't either, except I had to because I was living in my body. And so I didn't have a choice. And However, my mother was very supportive and... Uh, was actually really interested in in hearing the stories as I told them, and one of the one of the earliest nightmares that I had was um, it was about a plane crash. Um, it this was in um, hmm. this must have been nineteen. Well, it wasn't one of the earliest. It was 1996. It was in July of 96. And it was on July 16th, actually. And I called my mother the next morning and told her that I had had this nightmare and that I thought that it was a World Airways jet because on the wreckage I had seen WA. Um, I saw that it, the wreckage was in water. I knew the flight number. I I told her it was flight number 800. I knew there were 230 people on board. I I told my mother all of this on July 16th. Uh, I'm sorry. I I had the nightmare on July 16th. I told her the morning of July 17th. And this plane crash actually happened the following morning, July 18th. Um, My mom called me that morning and said, quickly, quickly, turn on the news. And I did. And it was, in fact, not World Airways, but it was TWA. I couldn't see the T on the wreckage. Um, And it was flight number 800. There were 230 people on board. No one survived. And it was actually 10 days after that that my husband moved out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's it. I, that I can't deal with this. So, um, unfortunately, I couldn't leave. <laughs> I was stuck with me. So, I, I stayed. But he left, and uh, we were divorced a short time after that. Um, On your... Yeah. Was it your mother's father that you met slash uh, didn't meet in in the garden? Is that where? Yes. Um, and was she interested in this stuff uh, as as a child, or did she grow up uh, having uh, similar things? I mean, when you, or yeah. was it because it happened to you? Uh, you know, her daughter. No, I think she was always kind of interested in this stuff, but she never talked about it until it started happening to me. And it's still to to this day, she's fascinated by this. Uh, she always has been, even even as a child. Uh, but she's never really had any experiences herself. In fact, there was one time um, my my grandfather wanted to talk to my mother. This was back in the spring of 1990, and. He had been dead for a couple of years at that point, and he had something he thought she needed to know, and he tried to contact her and couldn't, like she couldn't hear him. And so he called me on the phone, on the telephone. He made the phone ring in the middle of the night, and I answered the telephone, and there was my grandfather's voice again. 
And he told me that he was calling because he needed me to give my mother a message. And I said, uh, why don't you call her? <laughs> why are you calling me? And he said, well, I've tried to reach her, but she can't hear me the way you can ever since you were struck by lightning. So I don't know. It flipped some kind of switch for me that made it easy for me to to receive information and interact, I guess is the word, with um, another dimension. And interact is is a is a good word. I, I um because his, let me get your opinion on this. I think one way communication is 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 easy in the sense that lots of people can do it. Um, mm-hmm. You can talk to your dead now, and mm-hmm. I also think, although you know, this is where I get crazy. I also think they talk to us, and it just mm-hmm. w- sounds like a memory or a, an idea in our head. Like, oh, don't get it, don't walk down that alley, and you go, right. oh, I'm glad. Like mm-hmm. y- your intuition sometimes is the intuition, dead, right? right? Yeah, right. However, what you have is the ability to kind of interact, so we can go forwards and backwards <laughs> rather than one way. Um, is that you know, is that oh, you go? Yeah. No, no, go ahead, ask. Because, um, like, I don't know what you think of that, and also, is that something that is a weird way of describing it? You're in full control of, or does it happen spontaneously? You know. Hmm. I had never thought about that. Uh, no, I'm not in full control of it. Um, I wish I were in full control of it. Uh, But no, I did not make that telephone ring. Uh, He did. So, um, in that sense, he was in control. However, Jeff, when we were working on the book, Jeff asked me a very interesting question. And I immediately knew the answer. And I don't know how I knew, but this is it. As my grandfather was speaking to me on the telephone, and I heard him, I heard his voice. I heard the French accent. I knew who it was. I clearly understood the words he was saying. My husband was sitting next to me in the bed asking me, who's on the phone? Who is it? Who's calling? It was 3.30 in the morning. And I was ignoring my husband. I didn't want to waste the airtime with my grandfather by talking to my husband. So I was ignoring him. And Jeff asked me, what would he have heard? What would your husband have heard if you had handed him the telephone? Would he have heard your grandfather's voice? And I said, no, absolutely not. He would have heard, and I know this, he would have heard a very high-pitched, kind of a an electric sound, like just a high-pitched high-pitched electricity, he would not have heard the words or the voice that I heard. There's something that the lightning allows me to decipher. Um, It's almost like a code that I'm able to decipher that I know my husband would not have been able to do. Yeah, it is like, it's a good way of describing it, isn't it? It's like you are after the incident you're you're like a yeah you are a walking decoder ring for like the universe Mm -hmm. so exactly does this happen (laughs) i i had a guest on the other week um diana walsh basulka who also knows jeff um and Mm -hmm. in her latest research she's been dealing with people who are kind of more in the ufo phenomena um world and and one of them in particular um gets placed places because him just being around sort of triggers effects like um mm. strange things happen around him right does that happen to you now are you are you a, a decoder ring that also um unusual <laughs> things happen around as you just kind of go about your daily life they do they actually do um it, it's it's not something i find pleasant uh, it's 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 very disruptive, um, and I I don't talk about it. Like I don't bring it to anyone's attention usually when it happens. Um, however, there have been occasions when I 
just suddenly get information and and change courses. Like if I'm driving somewhere and I I know that if I continue on this particular highway, I'm going to be in an accident, I will turn and go a different way. Nice. It's what about um I, what I mean more like um, this is a spooky example, but like, do books fly off the shelf? Okay, like, uh, you know, like, you know, oh. strange, quote unquote, <laughs> supernatural events, which do tend to historically <laughs> yes. uh, are associated with people who go through things like this. Yes, um, those things happen to me occasionally, rarely, I should say, rarely. Um, there, one of the things that I am able to do is I see, I, I, I can see ghosts. <laughs> And there's actually one that lives in my house, and I'm able to see her. And I, you know, my dog can see her also. The dog always barks at her, um, but my husband can't see her. Uh, two of my children couldn't see her. One of them did see her, though. Um, and and kind of a funny story, when my daughter was a teenager, she had some friends over to watch a movie one evening, and this ghost uh, went through the room, and none of them, none of the teenagers, there, there were six of them there, none of them saw her except one. And he, he jumped up and ran screaming from our house screaming and actually had uh, wet his pants he was so scared and it was at that point i told my daughter there's a ghost and she lives here and i've seen her and i think that's what just happened i think he must have seen her and he has he's still friends with my daughter but he's never come back into our house <laughs> and and the funny thing is this ghost is she never interacts with us like i i don't know what she's doing here she doesn't move things she doesn't make eye contact with me she it's almost as if she doesn't even see that we're here and and Jeff actually has some thoughts on that, but well, what are, what are yours? Because what is your understanding of ghosts post your garden incident? Right, uh, like yeah. I, I, we can we again. I think she's stuck. I mm. think she's uh, kind of like a, a scrap of some kind of residual energy that is stuck, um, like. I I don't know how to explain it. Jeff would be able to explain what I'm saying, but that's that's what I, I think she's a scrap of energy. It's it is unusual and it has wider metaphysical implications because as you mentioned in the book, it's not like you live in some 13th century castle. Like right. she didn't die there as far as you can tell. Right. Right, she didn't. Um and actually she the house that we live in now uh, where I see her is not the house that we tore down the original house that was on this lot and we built this house and she only appears on the second floor of the house and this house is built much higher up because we had to build it up out of the flood zone so I think in the original house that was here which still was not uh 13th century yeah um i think in the original house um we never saw her we lived in the original house but we never saw her because we were not that high up off the ground and she just exists in that one uh you have to go up a certain distance to be able to see her and that distance is the second floor of the house she never comes downstairs. It's fascinating, isn't it? Like, it is. It is. That, that it's it's at a very specific, admittedly very low, but like it, it, mm -hmm. at a, it's at a low altitude, but like it is above mm -hmm. the ground and, and doesn't, even match, right. I, doesn't even match the existing it, structure. The it makes structure. me wonder if where she is is where the ground used to be. 
I guess if you're in a flood zone, but you- how old do you, how how long ago do you think she died? Is your impression? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, her clothing is definitely period clothing. I I just don't know what period it gotcha. is. I uh, it's old. I mean, a long time ago. Okay. Hundreds, so. hundreds of years, maybe more. Okay. Fascinating. Well, this is uh, one yeah. of the things that I thought uh, in the, because the book is, uh, is uh, how to just, dis- the way it's structured is very interesting. So you get the first half and Jeff gets the second half. And, uh, and right. if we're talking about ghosts and so on, uh, this is germane to the premium members. But tell us about your understanding of guides post garden experience. Hmm. My understanding uh, is that that uh, everyone has a guide um, in the garden. When I was there, I did not see any people alone. Everyone was paired up. I would assume with their guide that met them there. Um, my my understanding is that as we accumulate experience over lifetimes um we we move toward becoming a guide ourselves and that's kind of a a, it it sounds trite to say it but it's like a graduation like here we're in school and once we've lived enough lifetimes and and had the experiences that we needed to have to be able to graduate to become a guide then we don't have to come back here anymore. And that's my understanding of it. Yeah, it's uh I I that's uh, very similar to people who had very much influenced my thinking um early on 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 my own kind of spiritual journey. So I was fascinated yeah. to see where that uh overlap is, but it's 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 how does that work with a universe that's that sort of layer cake where everything's happening at once? <laughs> Like, how do you graduate? Like, ha- because the guide who uh, has, if he or she's been through, you know, 150 lives and is now available to help, he or she's also still going through those lives. Uh, mm-hmm. That's weird, isn't it? Like, that's, I wonder it how, is. I, I wonder how you plug weird. them together. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, the I did find it useful. Someone told me once, uh, I, I, I made a comment, this is, when I was at a, a seminar with Jeff at one point, and I said, I don't understand why I have these nightmares. I, I, I just don't understand the purpose. And someone said to me, well, maybe it's because you know you can go back to that plane crash and you can actually bring comfort to the people that are on the plane you know that death is not the end of consciousness. Yet, as the plane is going down for that 60 seconds or whatever it is, they're terrified and they don't know that. And if you can bring comfort to those people, then then go do it. Because you know that plane crash you know, may have happened 10 years ago, but it's happening today mm. and it's going to happen again tomorrow, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, you know, whenever, constantly, that plane continues to crash. So, go back and bring comfort to those people. Now, (laughs) that sounds like a lovely idea, and I would love to be able to do that. I don't know how. I don't know how to get myself back there. Mm. And, And I don't have enough control over where I land in that layer cake. I'm like the knife slicing through the cake, but I have no control over where where it stops. Fascinating. That was there, because you, you, you talk about it in the book, um, The was there a sense of obligation or responsibility 
mm-hmm. that sort of gradually developed or, or something like that, as you did start to realize, I, it turns out I am precognitive now and I can see spirits and, and these things have um, obviously a commercial value, but they have, they have a, a deep and intrinsic and profound value for mm-hmm. people who might be grieving or, or, or a bit lost. I mean, was mm-hmm. that, does that automatically come with it, or did you have to go through the process of going, oh. am I crazy? Now it turns out I'm not yes, crazy, but it, now am I ready to be public oh, about this? It took me 30 years. It took me 30 years to be able to talk about this. Um, I, I really thought I was crazy. I I really didn't know what to do with it. Now what I'm finding is that it, it's incredibly First of all, it has taken away my fear of death. So that right there is incredibly empowering. I mean, if if you can help people take away fear of death, that's amazing. And that is so rewarding on a personal level for me. Um, when I do talk to people that either are dying or have recently lost loved ones or even years ago lost loved ones if i'm able to bring them some comfort in the fact in in helping them understand that just because the person is gone does not mean the consciousness is gone that's huge and that has been the most rewarding part of this entire experience for me and that didn't happen until um, a couple of years ago, when I started, it w- I, I realized how much um, it, my ability to help people could could help. When Jeff and I started working on the book, and we started uh, speaking to groups about it, and the people would always start asking questions along those lines, and and I've really come to realize that this is what I'm supposed to be doing and uh, that it's amazingly helpful and empowering. It's, you mentioned, or actually Jeff mentions in the book, that you kind of suggest that maybe the whole point, that's a weird way of saying it, the whole point or value mm-hmm. or meaning of the entire incident is the book itself. So maybe mm-hmm. maybe you went through all of that for the book. It is it's funny. Well, not not the book per se, but but, yes. but what the book is saying and yeah. and taking away that fear of death. Yeah. And and that that ridiculous notion that death is final and that's the end because that's not true. It's um I you're definitely preaching to the choir here. I think uh, if you can get to that um if you can solve to your own satisfaction, I think it's an urgent thing that all humans should do, but if you can solve to your own mm-hmm. satisfaction that, that death isn't the end, it, it completely changes the game for how oh, you live your life. totally. Yes, totally. Completely, total game changer. You're right. Yeah. So, in that kind of – there are stories of you um, sort of – Beginning to use, like in a, in a clairvoyant setting, you um, you kind of secretly become a clairvoyant um, for a while there as, as part of <laughs> yes, the- <laughs> I did, I did. So I, can, I guess I that's did. what I was like. Uh, maybe that's your mother's bad influence, but um, <laughs> like that's sort of what I was thinking about. When did the sense of uh, it, the sense of responsibility or obligation, or dare I say, destiny or fate that you now feel b- with the event and, and the last few years with Jeff mm-hmm. and so on. Was there any of that beforehand? Because generally people who work in a profession like that do feel called to it, you know? Right. No, I didn't really. I I only did that uh, earlier in my life The when I was doing the the readings and the that type of thing. I was only doing it to prove to myself I could. I had to prove to myself that this was actually happening and that I really could know this information. And I I didn't enjoy it. I didn't, uh, you know, I would sit there day after day 
telling, answering people's questions, you know, a woman would come in and say, is my husband having an affair? Is he cheating on me? And I, I, you know, first of all, I felt like it was none of my business. It's not my business. Second of all, there was nothing personally gratifying to me in being able to tell some woman that her husband was cheating on her. There were, there was nothing in it for, for me. So that was a very short lived uh, career. It, I, I yeah. really didn't like it. it. I liked how you phrased that. So it's, it's to prove to yourself. So it's actually part of your journey of realizing you're in fact, not crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You right. have to prove it to yourself to go, no, let me just, field test this idea mm-hmm. I have that I am clairvoyant. Is, right. Yeah, it's right. cool. I like it. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, honestly, Elizabeth, I, I, the book is amazing. This is, this is a, a, oh, a truly, it's a fascinating story. And, and it's just, and I, I can see, obviously, it's some sort of fate thing. I, having read all of Jeff's books um, and his interest in things like mutants and superheroes and so on, I can see why he resonates so strongly um, with your journey, because there is something about it that is, is like archetypally mystic of, um, mm-hmm. of, of having that experience of the afterlife on holy ground in a way that ties in with mm-hmm. you know family ancestors and and, and so on it's right. it's a it's a superhero origin story for the ages for sure um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, and you know what i love to think about is here here's jeff jeff kripal born you know basically on a farm in nebraska and how does he end up a block from where I'm struck by lightning in Houston, Texas, at Rice University, I, it just it, I, I just love thinking about the the twists and the turns and 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 how that actually happens. It, and yeah, it, it, it's a big part of the story. I mean, if if we had met mm-hmm. independently, if you didn't know Jeff and and you were just on the show or something, I would introduce mm-hmm. you to Jeff as as the best person. Um, for you to in the world for you to possibly talk to about this, and he's a block away. And exactly, that's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. All right. Well, um, again, um, uh, obviously the details about the book and so on will be in the show notes for people listening. And I know hanging off every single word of your story, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank is, you. Is there anywhere else you'd like them to go online to um, find out more about your story or you or any of that kind of thing? I do not have a website, but I do have a Facebook page if they'd like to check that out. Um, I'm on Facebook under Elizabeth G. Crone, and um, they can like my Facebook page and and check my updates there. Wonderful. That will also be in the show notes. Well, again, uh, the book is Great. amazing. I think you're amazing. I think you're doing a really, really Thank profound you. And uh, an and important and hard thing. So uh, I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this whenever I can. Wasn't that great? It is definitely worth checking out the book if you want to know more. Uh, And the way the book is structured, I sort of mentioned in the show, is that Elizabeth writes the first half and Dr. Kripal writes the second, both in response to and as a elaboration slash continuation of Elizabeth's journey. So the book itself is actually part of the process in that, you know, delightful flow model way uh, we like around these parts. Uh, And as you know, If you've been here for a while or read any of my books or been to probably any of my talks, uh, NDEs and afterlife research are kind of my jam, uh, in particular the high strangeness that is associated with them uh, and its implications, I guess, in the ongoing development or play out of culture. I'll give you a brief quotation from Dr. Kreifel's half of Changed in a Flash uh, that elaborates on that. Let me just grab the book and pretend to put on my librarian bifocals. So this is Dr. Kripal now. When I refer to the modern near-death literature as a visionary literature and write for our vision work here, or write of our vision work here, I intend both meanings. Something is received or revealed, and 
Then something is created out of the gift. I mean to suggest that these revelatory visions of our own deeper nature are also projects that we must engage with and act on, that these need our attention and intention to fulfill their purpose, and that they are finally about us changing us. We can think of the entire history of religions in this way. We can think of it all as a long series of science fiction movies, with the scenes painted on the walls of the caves of the churches of the temples, and all of it inspired by countless and quite real supernatural special effects like precognition and auras. For thousands of generations, we have been born and then died into these running science fiction movies, changing the scenes and stories as we go, largely unconsciously and gradually, but sometimes dramatically and seemingly all at once. Not surprisingly, the religions have always known something of this, if in largely implicit, unconscious, or at least unexpressed ways. This is why they have so richly supported and funded the arts, not for art's sake, but for the vision's sake. They understand very well that it is the image and the story that ultimately define a community's worldview and religious experience. We do not have to share any of those values or beliefs, that is, we do not have to believe their movies, to see that they may well have been onto something very important, namely, that it is the image and the arts that largely determine what we see and what happens to us in the death process and in the afterlife, at least in the near-death zones from which we sometimes return. So you see where he's going with that. It's uh, uh, in, in Elizabeth's case, as obviously the example here, a Jewish cultural background uh, in some ways framed uh, the experience in the afterlife after you know what happened, but then she came back with it, and it it changes culture. So you change culture, and then you have someone else has a near death experience, and so on. So it's not like a one to one. It's a it's a, a loop and a flow model and an ongoing interaction. And I find that obviously um, fascinating. I gave a talk in London a couple of years ago called Campfire's Edge, which was very similar to that. So. Uh, Elizabeth's story is is worth the book in the first place, and and Dr. Kripal's uh, examination and continuation of it is also some real good reading. So, uh, yeah, that's this week's show. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcatcher or on YouTube. Find us at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page, and find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>